Hello, I'm Philip Stoughton from my house to yours. Welcome to EMS at Sea Level. Today, I am joined by Randall Sherman of New Venture Research. Randall, always a pleasure to get many people's insight, but particularly interesting to get yours because it's always backed by such um, such a deep dive of data, and I think that's hugely valuable. Um, as we look to 2023, it seems to be another year of disruptions, and uh, that seems to be the, the the norm now. What are you seeing as we look forward, particularly with respect to uh, the way supply chains are looking at the relationship with China? Well, let's start with the good news first. Uh, 2022 was a really good year. It was a bumper um, year, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, we Foxconn released their numbers, which again grew by 10.5%. And they can often be used as a proxy for the rest of the industry. So, mm. I mean, the numbers are still coming in, uh, fourth quarter numbers and things. But yeah, it, it was it was incredibly resilient. And uh, But there are clouds on the horizon. And this is mainly... Uh, brought to your attention, I'm looking at the situation in China, where um, the COVID is running rampant, like a forest mm. fire throughout the country. And now that they've uh, stopped, they've released the zero COVID uh, yeah. ideas. And they, you know, this is definitely having an impact on employment. And also, we got inflation starting to, to rise and went from zero to 4% right now. And that causes people to consume less mm. and, and then lose jobs because production is demand is low. And so it just goes into an intensifying uh, cycle or spiral downwards. And I kind of think that's going to happen here, mm. um, particularly for the first quarter. Um, I'm speaking to some of our subscribers who say that they think that it could go to the second or third quarter, but things should recover and mm -hmm. employment will come back. Um, but the COVID um, epidemic is really has really caused a, a huge disruption. I mean, right now they with the Chinese New Year coming up, uh, some of the participants or some of our customers, think that there's going to be, it's going to lead to um, like a 95% of the population having COVID. Wow. Yeah. Fortunately, it, it's it's probably the Omicron variant, which we, we understand is much milder. Mm. So they're going to probably end up following this herd immunity strategy, uh, which some people will die, but much, much less than before. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a strange yeah. It's a strange situation, isn't it? When we look at China over the last um, you know, we look at China over the whole period of the various different disruptions, starting with um, Trump's uh, trade war with them, uh, and then through the pandemic. And you know, they were kind of in at the very beginning of the pandemic, um, with the with the very early lockdowns causing that disruption to supply chains. Um but it seems because of chasing COVID zero, they've they've taken longer to get a grip with it. Meanwhile, the world's been looking at supply chain security and other issues around supply chain. And we're seeing companies like Apple uh, shift some manufacturing out of China and maybe taking not so much of a big leap out of China, but taking a strategic turn and saying, hey, maybe we need to um, you know, diversify our manufacturing portfolio somewhat. So I think from a Chinese point of view, it's, it's, it's a challenging year and it's difficult to see, um, see the progress they're making. But everywhere else in the world, the EMS companies I'm speaking to have, have as yeah. you said, had a bumper 2022 and a and a mostly pretty pretty positive and pretty robust about this year. Um, you know, with the caveat of, well, we're not quite sure what's going to happen with the economy. So I think there's 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 a very mixed picture out there, but it just seems to be more disruption and the requirement for more agility and flexibility to survive that 
Um, yeah, I think I think this trade tensions are st still a big worry on their mind um, mm. because it just there's a lot of companies that are starting to ask for contingency plans, you know, mm. in case supply dries up or or worker uh, employment goes up, unemployment goes up, mm. and so they're they're cautiously optimistic. Yeah, the people yeah. We've, we've talked to. Uh, fundamentally, there's with the uh, industry itself, like for example, the last two years has been spent on trying to rebuild the computers networks, they upgrade them. So we had a big bumper there take place uh, last year. TVs are kind of down. We think mm. that this year it could be could be a drop in production. Um, phones will, of course, remain really strong. And medical industries is going yep. Yeah, busy. Yeah. Well, and also automotive, EVs, that kind of side of things, IoT, home IoT, those kind of things. It's interesting when when I talk to a lot of the MS companies that aren't in the top 10, um, they're not overly driven by consumer based products. They're mostly, you know, there's a lot more industrial, there's a lot more automotive, um, there's a lot more medical, as you say. So those those tend to be more robust. It's the it's the very large ones, I guess, that are more impacted and the ODMs that are more impacted by um, trends with smartphones and trends with uh, laptop computers and um, and so forth. When I look at what has happened in the last the last year, we've also seen this big um, growth in inventory and growth in work in progress because of um because of what's been going on in the supply chain and that that's appeared in everybody's quarterly results and they've you know they're they're constantly talking about that that those issues with cash there should be the opportunity as supply chains ease to convert some of that inventory and work in progress back into capital um but that seems to have been if if anything, more of a stress on the smaller companies than the larger companies. And we constantly seem to be seeing this consolidation in the industry where when I look at your top 50, that seems to represent a larger proportion of the industry year on year. And when I see the top 10 or the top 20, that represents a larger proportion of the, of the top 50. Is that an ongoing trend? It is, yeah. It's we see that happen every year. I think the top ten represent seventy percent of the whole industry, and the top fifty, it's like ninety percent. Yeah. So there is this tendency to consolidate and acquire, you know. But there's, it's a good feeding system. It's an easy business to get into. Its barriers are low, <clears throat> and so a lot of people get started, and and investors seem to like it because it's got. Um, it's got a lot of a cash flow to it. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can deal with services and, and get some good margins, but people like to have inventory and equipment. Yeah. I don't know if you noticed or if you saw today that um, Google is laying off 12,000 people, about 6,000 wow. in its workforce. And we got Apple in there, and we've got Meta, we've got Microsoft. Mm. So there's, you know, that's sort of priming the pump here for a downturn yeah yeah well, yeah and we've seen the same with um with tesla and 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 twitter and the the Amazon. elon musk empire they've been um they've been they've been they've been um, jettisoning jobs at a at a rate and they've also i think they announced a discount in um in the price of teslas the um i heard there was a 50 percent discount on rate card for Twitter advertisers. Um, and meanwhile, they've had an online auction of some of the furniture at the uh, the Twitter headquarters. So, right. so I think there's that going on. But actually, when I talk to um, people in the electronics industry about the issue with unemployment and also with talent, what they're telling me is that there's there's a real disparity. There's all these highly paid software engineers that are being let go by companies like Twitter and, as you say, like Meta and uh, uh, and Google. Meanwhile, there's a shortage of operators, just as there's a shortage of baristas in the coffee shop and, and wait staff in the restaurant. So 
this disparity seems to be quite strange in terms of um, employment demand and that challenges the EMS industry in itself. If we if we have a strong reshoring trend towards the US, if they can't get staff, that that risks risks slowing that down. How do you see that? Well, this is how the industry began, as you remember, is that I think it was HP it was one of the first people to start outsourcing because they just didn't want to pay their hardware engineers as much as they pay their software engineers. So they just outsourced this as being non um on core. On core, right. And sorry. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and then so that that started a steamroller. So everyone once one cow crosses crosses the river, they all cross. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and so that's how the industry took off. But yeah, there are some um shortages of skilled labor, particularly management. Um line line staff seems to be pretty seems to be almost an infinite amount of uh, supply to that um but uh, a lot of that's starting to move to, to india mm. malaysia and thailand i mean they're just they're very cautious about dealing with china and getting wrapped up in mm. geopolitical problems yeah it's yeah and over dependency yeah 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 so yeah so so they're they're actually developing plans contingency plans you know for other locations and uh that's got them worried that's yeah so when when i talk to people about this idea of of contingency plans contingency geographies if you like many people tell me that the three major beneficiaries are um vietnam india and mexico and i think the biggest announcement we saw was um apple shifting some manufacturing of iphones and actually the newer models um into india and that will obviously pull some um manufacturing e ecosystem players with it so that's interesting right. how do you how do you see the opportunity in india how do you see the growth there is it is it something the country is ready for? We've talked about India for so long, and it's yeah, always so. been it's I always it's been good. about to about to break. I think they're going to be a good alternative, competitive alternative. Uh, the weakness, of course, is the infrastructure there, where mm. you can't get trucks in and out and freight and all that sort of stuff. But they certainly got a lot of smart people. And yeah, there, it's a low low cost area. Yeah, it won't stay that way. I mean. Today, China's cost for an average wage earner is three times what it used to be in yeah. the last 10 years, I guess. It's yeah. Much. So yeah. eventually, we'll yeah. deal with this. Yeah. When I look at India, I think it's it's fascinating. And, you know, if the whole industry worldwide is concerned about talent shortages, and I know that, you know, that's the case even in Mexico, where, where obviously costs are lower then one thing we do know about India is they're churning out graduate engineers yeah. at a rate that nobody else can compete with. You know, they're, they're the only ones that have that scale um, that, that China have had in the past. So, um, yeah, I think that's interesting. Mexico seems to be doing well as people look to shorten their supply chains and look right. to move back to the Americas rather than specifically the U.S. So, you know, it's. I think the rush to get to China was the wave that took place 20 years ago, and now everyone's done it, and they're starting to see the cost of that, the mm. cost, and uh, and each one sort of has its 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 strengths. Each yeah. particular com country has. So um, the, um, but I think there's going to be a little bit of rebalancing here. Where, yeah productions but remember that you can't quite walk away from it because when companies like google are making a foldable phone you know you've got a very unique display there mm. and you've got to be near your supply base yeah you can't just yeah. stick that in vietnam yeah that technology so there there is protection for for china in that regard yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And I think China's interesting that it, uh, and I always say this, that it kicked down the door with um, low cost labor and it's kept the door open with the, with with fantastic logistics and now the best supply chain in the world. You know, regardless of how much it costs to assemble, the bill of materials is is cheapest in China. There's, yeah. um, you know, it's 
It's as simple as that. How do you see the opportunity for the US to revive their manufacturing base with things like the CHIPS Act and the PCB yeah. legislation that we're seeing and tariffs? Is there a is there a, a desire and the capital behind it to kind of regrow that industry, an industry that was kind of left and mothballed, I guess, as that 20-year yeah. trend of shifting shifting east occurred? Well, I'm glad to see it shifting back. I mean, there's a lot of the semiconductor companies now are considering mm -hmm. building in the U.S. and, and other regions. And so, yeah, I think, I think sometimes the pendulum swing goes a little too far. You know, you're just you're giving away your technology. You're you're investing in in the the countries you're outsourcing to, and then they 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 sort of gain a certain uh, leverage over you. Hmm. But yeah, I think I think the U.S. is always strong for um, for new in, innovative new com yeah. companies, and uh, should 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 fare well i mean you've got the um i guess the optimism of, of the north american markets that can do anything kind of thing yeah. and, and willing to take chances and risk yeah so yeah. that's i think that's beneficial for the u.s you know when i look at the u.s i think of the um the benefits and opportunities it has in terms of manufacturing and i think two of those key ones are that it's amongst the most innovative regions in the world and it has just a, a massive consumer market so the uh, you know the proximity to innovation and the proximity to consumption are hugely yeah. hugely beneficial and if we see a greater trend in digital transformation which without doubt has been disappointingly slow yeah. um perhaps that will mitigate some of the the labor differentials and and help mitigate the the talent shortages It'll be interesting to see how uh, Xi Jinping survives mm -hmm. his his political career because you know at first he was touting uh, zero COVID really did have a couple years of of good success yes. mm -hmm. but it was so draconian and so people you know just couldn't take the lockdowns no. and the quarantining that took place. And he was sort of touting that as being, you know, as well as our superior political system compared to the decadent West. Uh, yeah. And now that's that's been kind of flipped on its side. So, we'll yeah, see. it's going to be interesting. And I think, you know, his third term and his um, the way they have adjusted so he can stay in power are, are some of the things that make other people, other countries geopolitically concerned. So. Um, I think everybody's going to be watching that to see what impact that has on the supply chain. Last question, Randall, probably a double digit growth in 2022, which um, certainly consistent with uh, just about every CEO I've spoken to. Um, predictions for uh, 2023, low single digit growth or no growth? Low, low growth. Yeah, there's yeah. always going to be some growth, I, unless things just really get nasty on the political stage, you know, in the war, you know, yeah. war in Ukraine and all that, where energy gets involved and, and yeah. production starts to take a go to hell, really. Yeah. But I, I think, I think the markets are a little more resilient to that, <clears throat> and everyone wants to see see growth, and so yeah, I, I, unless this really backfires and we go into a major recession. Which yeah, I don't see at this this point. So, so yeah. I think I think we'll have a a low year, but a good year. Yeah, I'm with you. Low single digit growth after a, after a bumper year, which may well be a chance to catch up with all the all the backlog, shift some of that inventory into uh, into working capital, and allow you know allow companies to either invest in digital transformation or continue their M and A and consolidation strategy. So. Interesting times ahead. Yeah. And I was just going to end with in the last, they fixed their supply chain issues in many cases, getting components and parts. I mean, not everything, but, you know, some of it's redesigned and some of it's just um, um, new design. It's coming yeah. Out. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's the end of a very messy bullwhip there. But uh, it good, it good. kind of evens itself out eventually, one, one hopes, unless there's another major disruption um, to the supply chain, which, as you say, with the... Um, with the risks around COVID and geopolitics in China could occur. Randall, always a pleasure to uh, explore the the industry's current state and future state with you. And I look forward to chatting again soon. Thanks for your time. Thank you too, Philip.